Hello, this is Matthew Robert Payne, and this is uh, another uh, uh, video accessing uh, the cloud of witnesses, accessing someone that I have spoken to before. I did a book with an interview with Joseph the Dreamer, and it was a good book, and uh, it really ministered to me because uh, I went to heaven one day and I met Joseph the first time I had a vision of heaven, and Joseph gave me his coat of many colors and uh and so I strongly relate to Joseph and when I interviewed Joseph last time uh in the book much of what he said in the book was ministering to me because uh, I've used uh the, the life of Joseph to cope and uh and I've most of my life I've felt like I'm in the prison house and uh not really in the palace and had this time of waiting so this should be interesting for people because i highly relate to joseph and uh tolu uh my friend here uh, has got some questions for joseph and uh so uh we'll start uh uh you can introduce yourself to lou and tell us why you want to talk to joseph hello my name is tolu johnson for those that already know me i became matthew's friend about three Two months ago, isn't it? A woman just yeah. recently, and we've yeah. been very close friends. We do talk about things of of God. My husband went to be with the Lord three plus months ago, and I've just been eager to just live in the heavenly realms. And Matthew has been able to guide me and coach me into that process. So just to keep my introduction short, but why I wanted to speak to Joseph is I've just been always encouraged by joseph's journey especially when my husband was here with me on that i used to use joseph's story to encourage him because he, he did face some challenges and sometimes i just look at what is the best story in the bible and joseph's story always comes to me all the time because there was quite a lot of similarities in what he was experiencing and in what joseph did experience and that's why i would love to speak to joseph just to understand more about what we are reading in the bible Okay. So, hello, so Joseph. What's your, what's your first question? Um, I uh, this is Joseph. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, to speak to you. Uh, uh like like anyone. Uh, with human feelings, it's always uh, always makes you feel uh good. Uh, to be appreciated and to be wanted. Um, uh, you know, uh, some people are just uh, put up with and tolerated and uh, and some people are really desired and uh, this uh, I imagine uh, not just you Tolu I imagine uh, there's a lot of people out there that would like to hear more about my story and as uh, Matthew shared he's written a book uh, and uh, uh, did interview with me and uh, the interview, the questions he asked me were questions that he wanted to know personally, and uh, it turned out to be a good book. So if you went on Amazon and typed in the word Joseph and Matthew Robert Payne, you'll come up uh, with the book and you can watch that. But hopefully <clears throat> uh, Tolu has got some answers that uh, will be really good. Um, I, I Matthew's got a rule that... Uh, he, he doesn't uh, make things longer than it needs to be, but it certainly he doesn't make things shorter. And uh, it was suggested that uh, by someone he really admires that he should keep his videos to half an hour. And uh, if uh, if I want to talk for six hours, well, um, it'll go for six hours. And we, um, we operate uh, in accordance and obedience to the Holy Spirit. And I speak on the unction of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so it'll go as long. And if you see how long this video is, uh, you can watch it in several uh, uh, takes, uh, you know, if it's too long. Uh, but uh, Matthew has no idea how long it's going to be. And uh, and uh, so, yeah, so thanks for uh, doing this interview. Uh, as a person who, who uh, has an inspiring... A story in the Bible. Uh, I'm uh, uh, very happy 
Uh, to to minister just to one person, there'll be more than one person tune in and watch this. But I really like uh, Earth now that uh, someone can uh, see a video interview with Joseph the Dreamer and uh, click on that video and see how long it is and actively choose to listen to it. So I know that uh, a number of you who are watching this really want to watch this and uh, um, I, I think uh, like pastors would really like to um, broadcast and they, they should really, they should really uh, post up uh, their title uh, for next week's sermon um, and uh, let the people choose to be at the sermon uh, and and uh, actively choose uh, to attend. Uh, no pastor, really, Matthew's never known a pastor to actually advertise what they're going to do each week. Um, some pastors are working through a book of the Bible, and so they know that Ephesians chapter 4 next week. So those people know, but normally pastors don't advertise. And so I'm glad uh, if you're listening to this that you clicked on this, and I hope that uh, you you hear some things uh, that really touch you. So, Tulu, what's your first question? Um, uh, thanks, Joseph, for coming on board. I think my first question is, how did you feel growing up without a mother? Because obviously you lost your mom at a early age. So what was the feeling, if you remember, when you were growing up? Uh, my mother was uh, important to me, and uh, like uh, any uh, child, you're really close to your uh your mother. Uh, if you have a good mother, some uh some mothers, I'd imagine, uh, for some listeners, weren't uh, really close uh, to their children. And uh, if that was the case for you, uh, you know, I'm sad about that. But uh, like Matthew, I uh, was tremendously close to his mother, and uh, so was, when you lose your mother, when Benjamin was born, uh, the last son of uh was uh when benjamin was born uh uh jacob uh, lost uh his his wife uh in childbirth and uh so um that was a really sad it was a heart heartbreak uh you you, you take yeah there was quite a number of sons and we all had a part of uh, of our mother in us. Uh, we also had uh, Jacob uh, married uh, two women, and uh, so uh, the the other uh, the hen uh, the other sister Leah uh, was also like a pseudo mum for us too. And uh, Rachel was our mum, and Leah um, Leah was in uh, Matthew interviewed uh, Rachel and Leah and. Uh, what came out uh, in that interview in a book called Great Cloud of Witnesses was Leah knew that she wasn't the first chosen and she wasn't the favourite. And uh, so she made a decision that she was going to be the best mother and uh, and uh, that uh, she was going to be a better mother to uh, Jacob's children than Rachel. And uh, so she put a lot of time uh, into a lot of resources and uh and, and effort into being a good mother and she not only uh put a lot of effort into being a good mother to her children but she put a lot of effort into me and she spoke a, a lot of uh a comforting words to me because uh you know all the children knew that I was uh Jacob's uh, favorite and uh and he he let that be known with the coat of many colors and many other ways and uh because he was Jacob's favorite, I poured a lot of uh, he, she poured a lot of time into me uh, just to uh, because uh, I was a Jacob's favorite, but more so that she wanted to love on uh, Jacob's children and it made no difference whether it was her child or or uh, Rachel's child. Um, Leah dearly <coughs> loved her sister and uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> she uh, had decided in a spirit that she was going to be an impressive mum. So it's very interesting that uh, 
that uh, she put a lot of time into me. And uh, when I lost my mum, Leah picked up the, the pieces and uh, was able to hug me and uh, tell me that uh, I, I can call on her as mum. And it, it breaks my heart uh, that I lost my mum. My mum dearly loved me and she was, uh, she was um, Jacob's favourite. And he, he, uh, he he really wasn't nice about it because uh you know he he made it really clear to Leah that uh Rachel uh was was his favorite and uh he he didn't even uh work for Leah and uh he was uh, ripped off by uh his his father-in-law and he was cheated and uh you know some people would just uh, say it once and not say it again but he was often showing through his actions that Rachel, uh, my mum, was his favourite. And it, it sort of endeared me to Leah that she handled it with grace and uh, she walked in a measure of grace and love that my mother didn't walk in. Uh, it, it's often, uh, you, you may notice on earth, or Matthew's noticed because he's overweight, but often... Uh, uh, women that are really overweight are really beautiful people and they're really outgoing and loving people and uh and Leah was overcompensating she was like an overweight woman she was just full of grace and love and understanding and um you you, you would have never known this uh, from the bible narrative and that's why it's uh interesting to be able to engage heaven and talk to saints um, and uh, Rachel was beautiful and she she was a stunning you know even if like objectively as a son I could look at my mum and say that she was really attractive and she was so much more attractive uh, in looks uh, than uh, Leah but uh, in when it comes to matters of the heart Leah shone and she had a, like a glory uh, on her of grace and love and understanding. And um, uh, all the children uh, come to really love Leah. And in that way, she won uh, Jacob around and he stops uh, speaking so much about how Rachel was his favourite. And uh, uh, when when uh, my mother died, Leah did become his favourite uh, because that's all he had left. Uh, so... I hope uh, that I gave you some insight that you didn't know. Yes, yes, you did give me some insight. Thank you so much. You did mention something about favorite, being the favorite child. So how did you feel being favorite child? It it was uh, it was embarrassing, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever been uh, in a position that someone's uh, like praised you or made a big deal of you and um uh, you could have done something uh it's okay if if you drew a picture at school and <clears throat> your father uh praises you and says that's that's a really good picture but um if if all the children uh drew a picture at school and your father was just going on and on about your picture and not your brother's pictures it becomes embarrassing and uh there was a sense of shame I had uh, being the favourite uh, because uh, Jacob, in some ways, he's he's the father of uh, the the nation of Israel and the twelve tribes of Israel sort of descend from him, and he's got a popular name. He's mentioned the the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and uh, he he's got a big reputation. But he was flawed. Uh, he he was missing something himself. And uh, he wasn't totally secure in himself. And uh, uh, his idea of uh, making Rachel his favourite uh, and um, and broadcasting that and uh, making me his favourite and, and broadcasting that, he, he didn't do me any favours in uh, front of my brothers. And uh, and I know it was my dream uh that and and telling uh my mother and father and my brothers and sisters that they were all going to bow down to me and my dream got me in trouble but it probably wouldn't have got me in trouble if i wasn't already 
uh, they weren't already jealous of me and uh, and I was uh, the favourite. It would have just perhaps just been a dream and they would have said, he's he's dreaming, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's gone crazy thinking that we're going to bow to him. But the fact that my father had uh, clearly shown in, in his words and his actions that I was a favourite uh, is sort of a, a lesson to everyone that uh, if if one of your children stands out and is more endearing to you, you, you're closer to that child, try and keep it private between you and the child. Uh, try not to broadcast it because uh, it really hurts the the other brothers and sisters and uh it really hurts the child it brings shame and embarrassment on on the child i i did plenty wrong you know i i every every child uh does things wrong and makes mistakes but i could do no wrong like i i'd make a mistake just like um my brothers and sisters but when they made a the mistake they were jumped on uh, but when I made the same mistake, my father didn't jump on me like he did, and it really wore their wore their patience thin. And uh, uh, it's nothing. It I, he he built me up, but he rejected them, and uh, they felt secondary to me. And so, I'd like to say it's a, a good thing to be a favourite, but it's uh it's a good thing to be a silent favourite. And uh, if you're a parent, uh, it's only natural. Uh, for you to maybe love one of your children more than the others, but don't um if you're got young children, don't uh don't broadcast that to the other children. Keep that between you and the child. Uh, Matthew had a grandmother, and uh, uh, Matthew has two brothers and sisters, so there was four of uh, them in the family. And his grandmother said to him you're my favourite, like, I really love you. And um, Matthew asked his mum, did she know uh, that I, I was her favourite? And uh, her mother said, no, she never told me that. Uh, she, uh, she did love you more than the others. I could tell she had a special place for you, but she never told me that uh, you were her favourite. And uh, I said, did she tell the brothers and sisters that I was her favourite? And she said, I never picked it up. They they never mentioned it, uh, just like she never told me. But I knew that she used to always like talking about you and uh, finding out about you and she had a special interest in you, but she never said overtly that you were her favourite. And that's the way to have a favourite my grandmother didn't even tell my mum or my brothers and sisters. I like th that's Matthew speaking. That's the way to have uh, a favourite, and uh, the way my father did uh, it was unwise. But that come from like a low self esteem. You remember he'd he'd uh, undermined his brother Esau, and uh, he'd uh, stolen the birthright and. Uh, the 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 name uh, Jacob means deceiver, and uh, so he had he had this uh, um, low self esteem sort of not a uh, fully uh, developed character, uh, not uh, not understanding himself in the right light, and uh, so the idea that uh, he uh, had Rachel as his favourite and wouldn't shut up about it. And the fact that uh, I was his favourite and he wouldn't shut up about that, uh, he didn't do me any favours. He put cast a long shadow on me, and uh, I was constantly trying to, constantly trying to make my brothers feel good and make my brothers feel worthy. I was constantly overdoing myself to show my affection and show my brothers that they mattered and they cared, but. Uh, the more I did that, the more it annoyed them. Uh, uh, to to them, it came off condescending uh, that I thought I was better than them. So there was nothing I could do until finally uh, they uh, sold me to uh, slavery. Thank you, Joseph. That was really, really interesting and, and insightful as well, especially for parents like myself and other parents that might be listening as well. 
you did mention something about your dream, which I would love to ask you, what made you to tell your brothers your dream? What well, you I, I, I was excited about that. Uh, that was my gift. Uh, yeah, Matthew has a gift of uh, speaking to saints in heaven and he's very close to Mary Magdalene and uh, Mary Magdalene speaks to him a lot. And so he'll often be in conversation with a stranger or, or a new person at church or whatever. And without even thinking, he'll say, I was talking to Mary Magdalene last night and she said this and he, he forget, he f totally forgets. It's that's like totally weird and he's it's totally crazy. You mean the woman out of the Bible, you're crazy if you think. He doesn't even consider that that's crazy. And it's the same thing. Matthew's excited about uh, speaking to Mary Magdalene. He wants to tell uh, the people what Mary said to him yesterday that was so impactful. But uh, so my gift was uh, interpreting dreams and I, I could interpret my brother's dreams and stuff. And I had been and I had a reputation for that and it developed really early. And uh, so uh, as a person who was all about dreams, like if someone's into prophecy, like Matthew's into prophecy, it just prophesies all over the place and continues to prophesy and loves to prophecy and and uh, will talk to his carer or he'll talk to people about a prophecy he did yesterday. And because uh, uh, dream interpreting dreams and dreams was my language, uh, I, I was excited about this dream and I didn't uh, fully understand what the dream meant. Uh, I certainly didn't understand the ramifications of sharing that dream with my brothers and sisters, but um, I did that out of excitement. Hey, God gave me a dream and this is what it is. And what do you think of this? <laughs> what do you think of picking up knives and going to stab me with it? Um, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people are wise on hindsight. Uh, they, they look at things in hindsight and say that was pretty stupid of Joseph uh, doing that. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know if any one of you uh, listening are over 30 years of age, you could, I, I could probably say, what are some of the stupid things you've done? And you should be able to think, unless you're full of pride, you should be able to think of some stupid things you've done. And uh, Matthew's consistently, consistently turning people off and weirding people out and not having any friends because he consistently shares like revelation. I got this revelation that the whore is the church and uh, uh, the descended uh, from the whore and all the whore's children and Jezebel's children are actually uh, like the other children and the denominations of, of, of saying, what do you think? And the person says, well, are you saying our church is a, a, a daughter of the whore. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah, well, you're not really welcome in my presence anymore. You, you think I'm deceived. And Matthew's got no idea. He's just sharing a revelation that's exciting to him. And he, he's just sharing it to see uh, what other people think and whether it's true or real. He's got no hindsight or no understanding that that's going to turn a person off. And so Matthew will share a revelation with someone and the person will say, are you saying that about our church and our pastor? And I said, well, you're not the only church. Nearly all, all the churches teach this revelation of this and it's wrong. The revelation means this. And, you know, what do you think of the ramification? Well, the ramification is I don't want to talk to you ever again. But they don't say that. They just walk away and say, that's interesting. And he tries to engage them the next week and they don't want to talk. And they make it very clear that they don't want to talk. And what Matthew's done in excitement uh, the week before has totally turned a person off and made, well, the person's got a choice. They can accept the revelation and accept that they're in the wrong church and being taught error. Or they can say, Matthew's weird. He's crazy. He's totally off the loop. He's talking about our church uh, doctrine being out of line. And this doctrine has been in our church for 100 years. And who does he think he is 
coming up with something and opposing so many years of uh, understanding and uh you know, I can't possibly believe him because that would mean I'm wrong and I need to find a different church. So he leaves them with no option uh, that uh, to to accuse him of being a weirdo and crazy. And it says in 1 Corinthians, uh, the wisdom of God is foolishness to men. And uh, so, uh, so I shared like a dream, which is God's wisdom, God going before and showing me uh, what's going to happen and his plans. Uh, and that wisdom of God was there to prepare me. Uh, but uh, uh, to to my brothers, I was a fool. And to you people reading the Bible, I was a fool. Uh, but I was sharing something I was excited about. And I used to always talk to my brothers about my dreams. And I used to encourage them to talk to me about their dreams. And that was my thing. So for me to see a dream that seemed really important and really impactful, um, it would be the opposite of me not to share it because that was my culture, uh, getting a dream and sharing it. I just, I had no idea uh, that uh, that was going to cause me trouble. Thank you. And apart from sharing with your brothers, you shared with your father as well, probably yeah. with Rachel, I don't know. And your father was like, what do you mean? Do you mean I'm going to bow down for you? So do you, <laughs> what were you thinking when your father was replying your well, back? Well, it's, it's the same dream. And once again, I was excited and uh, they were just characters in the dream. And, uh, oh. and, and so... Uh, I was excited about my dream and my, my father and mother loved me. And uh, so I assumed uh, that uh, uh, they'd be excited about it like I was. And part of my sharing, I don't know if you fully captured it, but I was looking for an interpretation. I was looking for uh, them to either agree with my interpretation or give me the interpretation. My My father seemed to fully get the interpretation you're saying that in the future me and my your mother are going to be bowing down to you is it, it, it am i really hearing what you're saying is is that what you're saying son and uh, i think uh, that was one of the days where my father lost his pride and was humbled uh, by by my dream but uh, once again uh, calling me a fool and thinking i'm a fool uh, for for saying it, not fully realizing or receiving the fact that yes, that's going to happen. That's what the dream was saying. Uh, but uh, my father was astonished uh, that I had to hide to share that dream with him. And um, it's just like a deer walking into the headlights <clears throat> with its eyes lit up and just <laughs> stunned and not moving. I was that deer that uh, walked into the headlights and was stunned with the reaction that people had. And uh, so it cost me. And uh, I hope I hope me taking the time to share this, that it was my gift and I was always sharing my dreams and always looking to interpret. <clears throat> it was... It would just be like Trump not boasting, talking about how good he is and sharing about all his good ideas and how he lost the election and how the fraud. And, you know, <clears throat> Matthew used to be like a big supporter of Trump and uh, he believes uh, Trump is became an idol and God didn't allow him to get elected last time. Since Matthew's opinion has moved away from Trump, he can see that Trump is just a boaster and full of himself and a narcissist and it's all about him and how good he is. Well, uh, he's a boaster and it comes natural to him to boast. Just as he is a boaster and you can't expect him to be humble, uh, you couldn't expect me not to share my dream because 
<laughs> that was everything. That was my gift. So, uh, I re I, I don't regret it um, because that put me in the position to save uh, uh, my brothers and sisters and put me in the position to <laughs> rule. So what Satan intended for evil, uh, God turned around. I, I think people might be expecting me to apologise. Um, if if you are so good at dream interpretation, like very few people are, but if if you are really experienced in dream interpretation, you wouldn't hold back a dream. You'd always be sharing things and you'd be excited about it. And this was one of the biggest dreams I'd had. So holding it back isn't natural. Just just the same as uh, listening to Trump without ha hearing him boast. It's like it would be very unnatural for Trump to be humble and talking about his failures and talking about his insecurities. He doesn't do that. And so expecting me not to share it just because it seemed like it had ramifications that didn't present my brothers and my mother and my father in a good light. <clears throat> I make no apologies. Uh, that's who I was. Thank you, Joseph. I think as you were talking, what was going through my mind as well was the color, uh, the coat of many colors that your father sewed for you, and you put it on to go and deliver a message to your brothers. What were you thinking wearing that coat? I, you know, um, if if you were like a, a model and uh, you went in like a runway model and you became popular and <clears throat> a lot of people used to, you had recognition and uh, uh, the world used to like to book you. Uh, if Armani <clears throat> made a new suit, wanted to present this expensive suit, they'd put it on the best model and... Uh, if you're a model and you got this really nice cut and really good looking suit, you might not just model it. You might just take it out when you go out to look good. You know, you mightn't just uh, have have the suit on to do the runway show. When when you go out to a restaurant, you, you're going out on a date. You you'd wear the suit because you love it. Well, uh, the coat of many colours was dad's dad's way of saying i love you and it cost a lot and <clears throat> i wasn't just going to leave it in the cupboard so i wore it with pride and uh you know once again in hindsight it didn't make sense and it, it enraged my brothers but <clears throat> if you were presented a dress you won a dress uh in a competition and the person who came uh, first would w win this uh, gown uh, that would be part of the prize package. Um, you, you'd wear the dress. You wouldn't just uh, put it on in the award ceremony. You'd you'd take it out uh, to weddings and stuff, and you'd proudly display it. And so me uh, wearing my dad's coat of many colours uh, was like a badge of honour, something I wore, you know, and something I was happy to wear. Um, and even even if uh, I understood underneath inherently that I was enraging my brothers, well, perhaps there was a bit of pride in me saying, well, I am going to enrage you. I am the favourite. Uh, you should know it. Uh, so um, I'm not going to freely admit that to you that I was walking in pride because uh, that uh, would uh, be hum humiliating for me to admit. But uh, perhaps there was a edge of a, a tad of pride there uh, showing off uh, my coat of many colours and saying I'm his favourite like any child would say well I'm his favourite uh, and so this is just a reminder for you so I didn't fully admit it there I was just throwing that out there that could have been a bit of uh, pride there. Thank you yourself that was really insightful as well and I guess 
children that have been favorite as well are listening to this, making sure they are making wise decisions in future, not floating their favorism in front yeah. of the other children as well. But looking at where you were at the scene and your brothers were making decision of what to do to you, what were you thinking? Well, what were you the, the first were going to let me to uh, die in a pit and leave me in a pit. And uh, I, I sort of cried out to God uh, in the pit uh, because uh, I didn't want to die like that. So, uh, uh, so I was scared. Uh, it was naturally scary. My brother's treating me like that uh, and telling uh, my father that I was dead. Uh, but uh, it was sort of my cry out and it sort of made me happy that I was sold as a slave. Uh, you you got to understand uh, in that culture, uh, a father used to uh, sell their son for seven years into slavery, and uh, the son may, uh, the father may get a deposit on the house or be able to get cash to uh, um, plant twice as many crops that year and get seed and uh, prosper himself. And the son would go off and work for seven years and pay off the debt and come back. So slavery isn't something that you all you were always in or it was part of the culture uh, of of the day so um, you know not every slave master uh, treated you in a bad way so I wasn't full of trepidation uh, going in to be slavery at least I wasn't going to die in a pit so um, there's a lot of things uh, and this is what I encourage you uh, if you're watching this video and you've been watching some of Matthew's videos, you, you're really doing yourself a disservice not learning how to engage with the heavenlies and engage with the saints because uh, the Bible narrative, uh, the Bible story of my story doesn't bring out uh, this detail, you know. Um, I, I, I had uh, the spirit of favour on my life. I had favour on my life. And so when I went to Potus's house, he put me in charge of his house. He recognised the favour on me and the authority on me. And <clears throat> when I went to the prison, I was put in charge of the prison. Uh, so I carried favour. And uh, God has got a way of uh, promoting you and making you stand out. Uh, so not everything that's perceived bad in your life got and this is something you've got to understand perhaps you can uh, understand from my life and perhaps uh, it takes me speaking this to understand but you know Romans 8 28 uh, in the Bible isn't there by mistake someone who went through a lot of suffering and was beaten with rods and whipped and stoned and uh, and and mistreated and rejected and abused and starved and and uh, in the cold, shivering all night, without food, starving, uh, bandits chasing, people harassing, people abusing, someone who all that horrific stuff happened said, all things work together for good for those who love God according to his purpose. Now, that's a really encouraging verse, but it's even more encouraging written from a person who got so much abuse. You know, there's a lot of people uh, in the modern world that call themselves apostles. Uh, there's very few of them would sign up for what Paul went through. And in another way of saying that is you may be able to quote Paul and preach Paul, but you didn't live Paul. He, he, he made that statement. He made that verse as a declaration. It doesn't matter what you go through. God's going to bring glory to his name through that. And uh, so uh, I hope that uh, my life and what you understand in my life is that uh, it's there to demonstrate to you that all the bad, all the sad, all the unfair happening to you can and will be used for God's glory if you allow it to. But you can stay in your pity party and you can stay in your sadness and you can keep declaring to God this is unfair. You know, Matthew's walked in a hugely debilitating mental illness for 30 years he can't even get through one week without suffering or having it hard he had depression on him most days he wakes up and takes two hours to get out of depression and get out of that funk as 
close he is to God, he can't throw off this mental illness. And he's he's uh, had Jesus visit him hundreds of times, but Jesus has never laid hands on him and got rid of uh, the mental illness. And in, in life, uh, we suffer. Uh, but the understanding of that verse, when you got revelation of that verse, and Matthew's meditated that for 40 years, uh, and quoted that verse to himself for 20 years. When you understand that verse, you can go through anything. You can cope with anything. And you can cope with, with things that you can't understand and you've got no answers for. And why did your, your father get cancer? And why did he die so early? Doesn't God know that I needed a father? Um, why did why did Toulouse, uh, you know, why did their children her children lose their father why why do they cry themselves to sleep each day missing daddy well all things work together for good and perhaps some other daughters in the future uh, need a message to say jesus is enough and you can contact your father in heaven and you can walk with you imagine uh your daughters uh in in the future uh, learning uh, to engage with the heavenlies and in 20 years time saying to young women who've lost their father hey you haven't lost him just get in touch it's really easy um, so uh, uh, you, you can uh, Jesus words are, are just words but uh, when you understand the background of Jesus life and what he went through uh, then uh, you un they've got more meaning and more authority behind them. And uh, there's a lot of people quoting things and saying things uh, on Facebook and posting things they've got no understanding of. Like uh, the, One of the big uh, biggest, gravest errors you can do on Facebook is uh, read someone else's post and post it on your wall as though you posted it without quoting the name of the person who posted it. Matthew read something that was really profound and insightful on someone's wall once and wrote underneath, are you are you the author of this post? Because it seems to me that you've posted something of someone else's because this seems to be at a level of wisdom that surpasses you. Can you answer me? Was this your post did you make up because if this is this is the best thing i've ever seen from you and then there was a comment came in underneath no matthew this is my post and uh he's uh posted something i said without crediting me and uh it was only three days after that that matthew blocked that guy because he is just full of pride and self-righteousness and i want to share with you if you're quoting scripture and thinking you're good and quoting nice scriptures, if you haven't lived the Apostle Paul's life, if you haven't got the foundation, if you haven't been through suffering and trials, you can't uh, you can't quote, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you look at the words before he says that, I've learned to, to cope without money. I've learned to cope with no food. I've learned to cope with with no shelter i've learned to he lists a whole lot of things and then he says i can do all things through christ who strengthens me but if you read the things he'd been through you couldn't be through those things you couldn't cope with those things so when you quote that verse it sounds all nice and pretty but that's not the truth if you go through those things you'll be moaning and everyone will hear such a sad story you'll have this sob story uh, so you got to be careful that even in scripture that uh, that uh, the scripture has got its context based on what the author of that scripture has been through and you got to understand that unless you fully understand Jesus and the life he lived on earth and you you've had two-way conversations with him and understand him most of what Jesus said is totally above your head like these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Uh, very few Christians in the world have got revelation of what he was saying there. And everything of Jesus and everything of Paul, unless you understand where it's coming from, you don't understand. So I, I want to share with you, I had a hard life. 
uh, and uh, it was hard, but um, everything worked out to be good uh, or everything worked out uh, uh, for God's glory. And, uh, and uh, in the process of uh, being sold into slavery, I was counting my blessings and it was an answer to prayer because I didn't want to be left to starve in the pit. Thank you, Joseph. That was very, very powerful. So whichever whichever situation we experience in life, we should always say the good part of it, not necessarily the sad uh, part. We, we, we mightn't see the good part of it while we're going through it. Like, um, you know, uh, it's very hard for Matthew uh, to see the good part of uh, having his sleep reverse and falling depressed. It's hard for him to uh, cope with uh, waking up in a spiritual funk. Uh, you've you've experienced Matthew where he can't really talk or he's not in the mood to talk because he hasn't woken up yet and he's, he's depressed. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to see the good part of what you're suffering in the midst of suffering. It may come five years, 10 years, 30 years later that you see the wisdom of uh, God allowing it. So don't... don't uh, Put yourself in a position to say all things work together for good. You know, that's a good verse to quote to yourself while you're going through something harsh. And quote the verse as a promise to yourself. Hey, you know, I've got this addiction to prostitutes I can't seem to break. And uh, Matthew had like a seven-month break and then he fell back into it. Um, and, you know, he can beat himself up about it. Or he can say, well, I'm going to have a really good testimony uh, for people in the future when he does beat it. And he's going to be able to say, well, I got free of it uh, four times for six months and I kept on falling back into it. So don't think uh, that you're a failure if you fall back into your sin and you just can't get past it. Uh, so at, at present, uh, in some ways, Matthew's feeling defeated, but... He looks at all things work together for good, and that that's a promise to say that in the future, uh, what he's experiencing now is going to be a good testimony. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. I was also thinking when you were in Potiphar's, uh, no, not Potiphar's house, uh, where the wife wanted to sleep with you. Yeah, which Potiphar's house. house. Potiphar's house, and obviously you ran away and left your coat. When I read that in the Bible, it just shows to me that Joseph really, really wanted to stay away from sin. What kept you in that situation? Because it's easy to have slept with Potiphar's wife and just think, well, I'm, I'm already the head of the house anyway. I could get away with whatever I wanted. I, I uh, Every human, uh, the laws of God are placed on the human heart and the... Uh, uh, um, people may not realize that, but uh, realize this, but um, that happened before the laws of Moses were handed down. Uh, so there wasn't a law that shall not commit adultery. That that didn't exist. That that wasn't a law that was part of the Israelite race. The Israelite race hadn't even started. Uh, so that was something I knew in my spirit. This this is another man's wife. I can't do this. And uh, she had, was a Jezebel and she was used to control and she'd seduced Potiphar and she was a pretty woman and she had control and Potiphar had authority and and, and wealth. Uh, and she didn't have everything she wanted. She saw me. She saw I was young. I was attractive. I had authority and power. I was almost as powerful as a husband. She could probably even see her siding with me and me going off and starting uh, like a business and being more successful uh, than a husband. So she was saying, I want that. And as a Jezebel, once again, another Jezebel, as a Jezebel, she says, well, I'm going to take that. I want that. And uh, I loved Potiphar and it broke my heart that she did that and I had to uh, choose to say no to her uh, I, once again in hindsight 
uh, that wasn't a wise move, but it's never an unwise move to obey the your conscience and obey the law of God. So it was an unwise move, me saying no, because uh, I had no idea she was going to take some of my cloak and uh, accuse me of that. But every day in prison, I wasn't regretting that decision I made. And people might think I languished in prison and you know, if he'd only slept with her and she wouldn't have accused him. It's never the right thing. Matthew talks about uh, his addiction to prostitutes and how he's fallen back. It's never a good thing to be in sin and uh, be doing sin, but you've got to learn your lessons. And sometimes you don't learn your lessons right. And I'm, I'm proud to declare that uh, I didn't fall to that. And many men in that position would have, uh, uh, would have done that, and uh, but uh, I didn't, and uh, so I don't regret it. Uh, Matthew's got no memory of uh, the fact that I lost my coat of many colors there, um, and uh, so he doesn't remember that in scripture, but um, that uh, would have been sad, but there was a lot of sadness in my life, and uh, because my life was so sad and so hard. It encourages so many people, and uh, Matthew's come to understand that uh, uh, you can have the gift of encouragement and encourage a lot of people simply by being honest about the bad things you're going through. And uh, even if you're going through something really bad and really sad, and you've got no answer for it, and you've got no answer for the people you're sharing it with, uh, for all the other people who are suffering that same thing, it's encouraging. They think they're the only ones. They think they're the failure. They think they've got no hope. And to hear someone else with 4,000 videos and 120 books say, I'm suffering the same thing and I'm struggling, they're able to say, amen, you know, I'm not the only one. I'm not alone suffering that. So Matthew has uh, no shame in me saying uh, what he's suffering with because perhaps there's one or two people listening to this saying wow he just comes out with stuff he's not ashamed and uh, the fact is Matthew's just in a back seat here I say whatever I choose I say a whole lot of things Matthew's never acted as a pedophile he's never touched a young child he's never touched anyone uh young that's not of age and uh he's really proud of that because satan's accused him of that and tried to tempt him uh to do that and uh he's really proud of that and he can say that and that probably means a lot to everyone who's sexually molested because a lot of people who are sexually molested go and molest and that's essentially what uh, Potiphar's wife was doing she was she wanted to rape me she wanted to take what was not hers and she thought her beauty and her charm and her wealth and her perfume and her allurement allurement and her seduction and her beauty was going to win me over because it always did and she never failed I was the only one who'd ever I wasn't the only slave that had been approached by her but I was the only one that said no and uh that's uh uh I know uh Jezebel uh it comes up quite a bit with Matthew but uh but uh Jezebel's have got to uh be refused from time to time they've got to learn and uh, she regretted that and uh but um, she she isn't named in the scripture as a Jezebel, but uh, that's what she was. And there's some people who uh, it's my way or the highway. And uh, I guess I had the highway because uh, I I didn't succumb. So you can be proud. Uh, all those males there where uh, a woman is making it uh, clear to you that she wants you um, sex outside of marriage is never agreeable to God. It's never the right thing. Uh, Matthew's brother uh, was going to win uh, won an award for um, a best business creation, and he was in the um, the three companies being uh, you know um, considered for it, and the woman in charge of the awards uh, liked uh, 
his brother and made it clear to her brother that his brother that if if he slept with her he'd win the award and uh, uh she was attractive and it was a very attractive uh, offer uh, but he said to himself i'm going to win this award fair and square and you're not going to manipulate me to uh, sleep with you um, I'll take my chances I'm not going to sleep with you he didn't say that overtly to her like that but he said no thanks and he didn't win the award and she after the award she made it clear that you lost it because of this and he's he's proud that uh, he resisted but not every man can resist and not every female like it's the typical thing in Hollywood that uh, you can't get the part unless you sleep with the producer or the director. Or uh, apparently, it's very big in modelling. Uh, you can't you can't progress in modelling unless you sleep with the photographer or sleep with the management. And uh, uh, so many females have to sleep their way to the top. Well, they don't have to. They've got a choice, but they, they have to choose. Uh, the choice to be a second rung model, not a top class model. And uh, um, so you got to make your choices. And my life is just a choice. So I'm proud of that choice. I, I'll get celebrated for that choice. But just as much, God is a God of forgiveness. So if you made that choice in the past and you compromised your faith, well, get over it and don't do it again. God loves you and he forgives you. And God tends to love the sinner more than he loves the righteous. And Jesus uh, made that clear when he talked about the 99 and the one. Uh, God ma makes is more happy over one sinner than repents and the 99 of the righteous. So if you're looking at this and listening to see that Matthew fell into sin again and saying, well, you know, he's not very good and you're judging him, well, you, you may find that uh, uh, Jesus... Uh, said to Mary Magdalene when she washed his feet, she said that he that sin much loves much. And uh, if uh, you're a wild, uh, obsessive sinner who's done a lot of sinning, when you're forgiven by Jesus, you tend to love him more than the people that have never put a step wrong. Uh, so um, I had some trauma in my life. Uh, part of the trauma in my life was my father making me favourite and uh, and and boasting, and that came out of uh, Jacob's insecurities. And uh, I call him Jacob. I call him Dad sometimes. I call him Jacob sometimes. Um, but I hope uh, that was comprehensive for you. Thank you. Thank. You. I think mentioning your father's name made me remember to ask you, what do you think is the importance of name? Because you said your father was named Jacob Supplanter and he ended up playing that role in real life. So for parent listening, what impact does name makes in a child's life? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was uh, a child uh, Matthew heard about uh, one time uh, that uh, kept on, he's in uh, America, and he kept on causing trouble at schools, and he'd been to about six schools and been expelled and continued to be in trouble, and uh, come across some person, like a counsellor or someone who was brought in to fix it, it was a Christian counsellor, and he said, um, he's got a strange name, do you know what... Uh, his name means and they said it's an african name and uh it means this he's named after one of the demonic gods and uh, so he was named after a demon and so he was playing out that demon's character so they changed his name to gideon and the mm -hmm. kid transformed they just started calling Gideon. He started to align into the meaning of Gideon and uh, he his whole character transformed. They didn't give him any counselling. They just changed his name. So uh, you'll see Abraham was Abram. He, he got his name changed to Abraham. And uh, Matthew thinks from memory, uh, Abraham means father of nations. So he, he was... He, he he may have been the father 
when when God changed his name or meant to be a father in the future. But at some stage, God changed his name to Abraham, meaning father of nations. Then he's able to say to Abraham, as as many stars in the sky, so will be your children, or as many sands in the ocean, uh, so will be your children. Uh, so uh, every time someone called him Abraham, they were saying father of nations to him, and he started to have faith in that name. So uh, uh, Matthew means Matthew means gift of God, and so if. Uh, a Matthew comes into himself and finds himself and uh, heals himself and uh, becomes who he's meant to be, uh, overcomes his trauma. He, he's God's gift to everyone. He's he's like a gift, and people are like Matthew's carer today was filling up with tears and saying, "You bring me so much peace every every time I leave here. I, I'm just overwhelmed at how." peaceful I am and you just bring peace to my life and uh, that's what a gift of God would do for you and Matthew's middle name Robert means shining one um, and you know Jesus said you're a light on the hill or uh, you know let your light shine uh, there's also verses about glory of God shining and sometimes people do a double take at Matthew because he's shining well not everyone comes into Robert not every, everyone become someone shining but uh, when you're walking in the spirit and you found your purpose and you're fully healed then you start to shine and uh, pain uh, Matthew's last name pain means from the country so when you're from the country you're friendly with everyone you're outgoing and you're really honest and stuff you've got nothing hidden you're not scared you interact with people so Matthew's name is like really powerful name so uh, as, as a mother uh, you can look up a book there's books called baby naming books and uh, it's got the names of all uh, all the different names and the meanings of the names and you don't have to pick a biblical character name uh, for your child but uh, my mum uh, Matthew's mum had him and she 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 said to Matthew uh, at one stage, you came out of my womb shining. I thought I'd given birth to an angel. And um, later on, Matthew uh, felt that he was an angel, had revelation that his former life was an angel. And he told that to his mum and his mum said, I never said that. And she was assuming that Matthew was mentally ill with his revelation and she wanted to back away from that but he came out shining and I was so I was uh, he, he was so contented he such a placid baby and she'd she'd had uh she'd had two other children before so she could compare and it's just uh, he was just such a joy so she had one of these baby books and she was turning through the baby book started at A and must have got to Matthew and it said gift of God she said that's who he is He's a gift of God. So she recognized gift of God in Matthew and named him. And um, then uh, Rodney, Rodney, uh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, Rodney's like a strong sort of warrior name or whatever. Uh, so uh, I'd encourage you as a parent, uh, like God certainly did, like um, uh, Simon Peter, Simon was, uh, Peter's first name he, he was called Simon Peter and then uh, Jesus named him Peter Little Rock uh, so um, if you want to change the destiny of your child or your child is uh, not performing too well well look up a, a meaning in a baby name book and change your child's name uh, to something you want them to align to because um, what what a man speak of, so shall he come. What a man think of, so shall he become. Uh, your your mouth uh, uh, brings forth. Old Testament says uh, brings forth life and death. And if the meaning of your name brings death or something bad, uh, you continually to pronounce that name over a person. That the the spirit of that person will conform to what that curse you're saying over their life. But if you're speaking um, God's promise or 
uh, or grace or something, uh, God's grace or um, or shining one or bright flower or something. If you're saying that over a person by saying the name all the time, they're going to conform to that. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. That was really useful. Also, a fast forward. Obviously, you became the king of uh, Egypt. Remembering, what was your relationship with Herod of that time? Uh, Matthew's got no recollection. Uh, 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 as far as uh, Matthew's concerned, there was no Herod. There was a pharaoh, you mean? Pharaoh, yeah, Pharaoh, I mean, Pharaoh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he could see the favour on my life and uh, it wasn't just my interpretation of uh, of the dream that got me out of prison. I continued to interpret dreams and I had a real gift for business. I had a real gift for management, uh, for people control. Um, what people don't know is uh, the advice that I gave to Herod, uh, uh, to uh, the Pharaoh, was if they didn't have money, they could sell their property to us and uh, they could sell their people to us. And so uh, I enslaved uh, all the nations. I took all their property. Uh, they they become slaves to Pharaoh. I, I took control. Uh, I um whether you know this history, Matthew found it out. I become like a ruthless, overbearing leader, and mm. I I took advantage of a lot of people. And Pharaoh was happy like that. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So I I sort of uh, out of the outworking of that dream and uh, the uh, storing of all that food. <clears throat> Um, Pharaoh <coughs> became the Egypt that it became, became <coughs> powerful because of my role in that. So he really respected. Uh, I outshone him. I was more equipped than him. I was more powerful than him. I was smarter than him. And a smart leader will let someone uh, take control and step back and let me run it. I ran it better than he could run it. And um, I think they interviewed Henry Ford. Uh, Matthew uh, has heard they interviewed Henry Ford and uh, uh, they said that uh, he was really smart, that he was really wise. And he said, uh, I'm not so much wise, I just hire people that are smarter than me. And... Um, mm -hmm. And so there's real uh, wisdom in that. Uh, uh, humility uh, allows you to <clears throat> put people on and put people in places of authority <clears throat> that are more experienced than you and Thank wiser you. than you. Thank you. Thank you. And looking back, obviously, when you were ruling, your brothers came to you. And obviously, you remembered the dream you remember what happened but they did not recognize you <laughs> until you told uh, one of your servants to go and implant a, a cup in your bro little brother's um, uh, belongings and you wanted to know whether your brothers were still loving to Benjamin I guess what was going through your mind what were you trying to achieve by all the scenario that happened in the bible well I I wanted to see my father again, so I had to set that trap. Um, and uh, they didn't initially agree to it, and I had to uh, do something to get my way. Um, you got to understand, at that time, I had a lot of power, and I had sort of... Uh, <clears throat> this is hard to uh, admit, but like I'm in heaven. And I've got the righteousness of heaven in my life, but I had some of the characteristics of Jezebel in my life, like absolute power, like having authority and having control. And uh, so I wanted my way. Like, I didn't have to force my father to come, but uh, I wanted to see him and 
I wanted to save my family and I wanted things my way. <laughs> so I did that deceptive thing on my brothers and my brothers didn't like that. Uh, and uh, But I forced their hand uh, and uh, it worked out for the betterment of Israel and saving my family. But um, that can be a weakness of someone who's used to getting their way if they insist on their way and sometimes it's harder for the spirit of the lord to control someone who's always in control and that's your challenge you're so uh so uh in control you're so used to taking uh ball by its reins and taking control that uh this whole process of entering the heavenlies where you're out of control and you haven't got control and you can't master it it's frustrating for you uh, so it's harder for the spirit of the lord to lead someone who's very confident and very uh, leadership and very strong and used to organizing everything themselves because <clears throat> sometimes the holy spirit wants to take control and it's like a battle of wills and uh, so uh uh, I was a person who was used to getting control. And so that's the underlying context of uh, what I could have asked really nicely for the brothers uh, to return uh, with their father instead of taking uh, that position that I did. But I didn't do that. And, uh, of course, Jacob didn't want to lose Benjamin because Benjamin was only the second son of Rachel, and that's all he had left of Rachel. <clears throat> so I played that card, and uh, it was kind of riffless of me, And uh, but that was my character. I got some of my character from my father. Thank you. I was thinking you did that because it was like a payback to deal with your brother. No, no animosity. I totally forgiven him. Oh, that's good. Thank you. That teaches it's me. I'm glad well. we cleared that up with you. <laughs> because sometimes I always feel like paying people back if they hurt yeah. me. Well, really. that's not the spirit of the Lord. I know. So I'm learning. So it's good to know that you could still forgive no matter how awful it yeah. is. It was just, uh, I didn't ask, I forced the hand because I wanted control. Thank you. And Thank people, you. People who are in control, who have a lot of authority, <clears throat> it's hard to do a course <laughs> correction with mm. them. They've got to be humbled sometimes. So some of the most competent, forthright, leadership, <laughs> powerful people, <laughs> the Holy Spirit finds it really hard to direct them. Thank you. Because they you. won't I... relinquish control. Oh. So I need to learn to relinquish control. Yeah, that's the message I'm sharing with you. You're, you're only bat batting your head up against the wall because you're used to being controlled. And uh, heaven's saying, let us take control. Uh, this is going to take a while and you're not going to, uh, you're not going to, achieve it by your own force of will i will have to follow the timeline of heaven not my own yeah. timeline so we're gonna uh, unless you got too many questions uh now no, no. my if last you, question gonna, you got your last question what's your last question my last question i think i've forgotten i escaped my mind i had a question in mind matthew matthew should have a break so think of the question. He'll be back in a, about uh, two minutes. Thank you. Think of your last question. Okay.
with a man. Yeah, almost ready. Okay. Do you remember your last question? Yes, I did. So my last question was actually when your father was about to pass on to heaven, Jacob, and he called all your brothers and said, I will tell you what will happen to each one of you in the days to come. How did all the brothers felt about what their father did tell them about the future? I know yours was great, but for other children, there were some news that wasn't nice to hear from a father. Um, in those days, uh, the spirit of the Lord would come on a father and he'd give the blessing. And it was like a cultural thing that uh, they may not hear the spirit of the Lord minister through their father very often. But in that uh, time, it was like uh, the inheritance. It was a dividing of the property when he dies but there was like an inheritance in the blessing and uh each uh child fully embraced what was said because that's their future it was part of the inheritance and it came down from the father's authority so yeah remember when uh when jesus or the spirit of the lord said to paul that i'm gonna uh, cause a lot of hardship in your life and uh that there was Matthew can't remember but there was something that was said to him that said that it's going to be really tough and um yeah. so when those brothers heard those things Matthew doesn't remember the hard things that were said uh that's uh news to him but so I can't really speak in that but even if it were tough things were said uh the brothers were prepared for it one time Matthew was teaching a couple to uh, hear from Jesus and uh, the, the husband spoke first and he said something and then uh, then the wife went on and the wife said something that you're going to really be sifted and you're going to go through a hard time and um, and she said I think uh, and when it's fin finished uh, Matthew said to uh, the husband, the Lord told you that, but you didn't tell me. And he said, I, I didn't want to tell you. And uh, I said, well, uh, sometimes telling someone bad news that's coming like, prepares them for it and it makes it easier. And uh, over the next five years, Matthew went through tremendous hardship. It was really hard. But if it hadn't have been for that prophecy on that day, it would have crushed him. But he knew a sifting was coming. And so in the process of the sifting, he had grace for it. He had, God had, in the prophetic word, God had uh, provided the grace because he knew that it was a process to refine him. And when the process was finished, he would have been refined and come forth as gold uh, so he understood it and coped with it more because of that warning. So uh, when 
uh, the father, when Jacob spoke forth things, even if they weren't flattering, uh, the sons could adjust to that and align with that and participate in that and carry that out. Uh, so uh, when you understand it from that perspective, there's no bad news, right? Yeah. That's, uh, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And, um, you know, once again, I want to reiterate, you may know that verse, uh, but um, but uh, you may not have suffered. Uh, but now I've uh, brought forth that verse a couple of times in this recording. Uh, there's some of you listening that are going to go through a very hard time soon. And uh, you've heard that verse a couple of times as a warning that... Um, that it's only Christ and it's only your relationship and it's only your intimacy with God that's going to get you through the testing, especially coming to this world. There's going to be more coronaviruses and more plagues and it's going to be a time of testing and uh, the times of Jacob uh, sifting is coming to this world and you're only ever going to get through it through uh, having a faith in God and uh, a supernatural understanding and assurance and pulling down uh, joy and endurance and uh, happiness and praise uh, from the Holy Spirit. You're not going to make it otherwise. And uh, so, um, yeah. So i got a bit of a surprise for you, uh, Tolu. Uh, now we're going to switch it up because uh, these uh, supernatural things are meant for you to become experienced. Matthew doesn't really need more experience in carrying voices. So uh, um, Matthew's got a few uh, questions for you, and now you're going to be Joseph. Oh, my God. Well, I'm going to try whatever comes into my mouth. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's by faith. And uh, yeah. and we're not going to, we're going to upload this video. So even if you make mistakes, uh, the whole world is going to see mistakes. So I thought I'd say that to take a bit of pressure off you. Um, so uh, in in the prison, uh, in Matthew's book, and I really uh, recommend Matthew's book about me, in the prison, uh, it, it said in the book that uh, I went around uh, delivering people's food each day uh, in the prison. That was my job. Um and as I delivered the food, I used to ask them, did they have any dreams that night uh, that uh, they need interpreting? And uh, within the prison, I exercised my gift in interpreting dreams. And people used to have disturbing dreams. And I used to tell them what that meant. They had good dreams. And I told them what that meant. And I was like ministering prophetically in, in the prison while I was being busy doing jobs and being in charge, I was also administering my gift. Uh, so my question to you is, um, uh, uh, Matthew's question to you is, um, why, why, why did you constantly give to people and exercise your gift in prison? Well, just as speaking, you constantly. Just I, I was constantly giving the gift because that is the gift that God has given to me. And that is the gift that I've operated in as a little child, which obviously got me into prison in one way or the other because of the dreams I was telling my brother. So I've been used to my brothers coming to me, asking about telling me about their dreams and sharing what I think the dream meant. So, and that has been my way of life all my life. So being in prison, given when when people tell me of their dream, telling them back, it's a way of me encouraging them and it's a way of me sharing my gift and growing in that gift. So I, I do find joy in giving my gift. So that's why. Yes, yeah, so uh, would you, uh, uh, so many uh, people... Uh, in the world, in the Christian church, uh, uh, in a church that doesn't allow them to operate in their gift, uh, what mm -hmm. advice would you give to uh, people who've got the gift of prophecy, uh, but uh, their church uh, doesn't allow them to prophesy to people? What advice would you give to a person 
uh, who's got a gift of prophecy, but the church doesn't allow it. Yeah, the gift, the advice I'm going to give them, just like in the case of the prison, where I was, whenever I'm given paper food, I'm using that opportunity to ask of their dreams and obviously telling them the meaning. In the same way, you don't need to go into a church to prophesy to be able to to be able to use your gift. You can always go to individual people that God has lay in your heart to prophesy to to give them the message or like Matthew does whenever he's going around he's, got, he's going to strangers approaching them and telling them this is what God tells me about you so whenever the Holy Spirit lays it in your heart to speak to someone or to prophesy into someone's life just take that step of faith and do it not necessarily it might not be in the church but it might be after church it might be during the service it might be outside it might be total stranger it's just learning to obey god and let it be a way of life so matthew's got a uh, 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 a website uh when you get an email from uh matthew uh there's a website called lost penny found and you can type in uh, to uh, Google Lost Penny Found Prophecy and you can find a website uh, that uh, does uh, free prophecies, written prophecies for people. <clears throat> so me as a person uh, would recommend uh, that uh, you find a way to exercise your prophetic gift. Uh, find a website that's offering uh, free prophecy and ask them, uh, if you can practice on them and get a place uh, prophesying with them. So there's always a way to do it, uh, whether you do strangers. So um, I've got a book called Prophetic Evangelism Made Simple, and it's all about that. I really encourage you. Um, if they've got a gift of music and uh, like uh, they uh, uh, can play a guitar or play drums and... Uh, uh, they've approached their pastor and uh, the pastor has said, no, we've got enough guitarists. We don't need you. Without the person being disobedient or uh, like complaining in the church and being rebellious to the pastor and complaining to other people in the church that he won't let me play, what would you recommend uh, someone with uh, the gift of playing guitar how would they exercise that gift if they couldn't do it at church? Uh, what I would recommend is you need to be creative about the dreams that, sorry, about the gift that God has given you. So if it's your gift is to be able to play guitar, you might not be able to play it in the church, but you might be able to play it in a smaller gathering, maybe like a fellowship. You might be able to play the guitar. You might be able to do something similar to what Matthew is doing, where you're able to play it and put wherever you've played the video on YouTube for other people to see. And you might just, some people just go outside, just and if you're bold enough to be able to be outside on the street and playing guitar and worshiping. So you have to find other ways of expressing that gift or probably continue to go into practice as well in the church and maybe over time it will be your time to be able to play a guitar in church so it's about just giving it time your own time is might come in the church and if it doesn't come don't get discouraged find other ways you could play it outside of the church environment would would you uh that's that's really good uh anyone can uh, turn a uh, practice and rehearse and turn a camera on and uh, play songs on YouTube. And you may only have uh, five people watch the video, but uh, it could really touch one of them and uh, someone could really be touched. Uh, so uh, that's really good. Uh, even if you can't sing or you don't feel you could sing, it could still play the tune and people would still listen. Um, uh, also busking, going out and busking, uh, was good advice. Uh, it's really obvious that uh, uh, you're speaking through Tulu, Joseph. It seems that uh, anyone can hear that gift. Uh, would uh, to, uh, Joseph would would you uh, recommend uh, that uh, they approach another church and uh, play music in another church while still members of the original church, or 
do you feel that that would be an act of rebellion? Would would uh would the way to do that uh, get permission of your pastor to say I'm going to play in the worship band of this other church? Well, I think this this individual uh, circumstances. I wouldn't say that everyone needs to take permission from the pastor to be able to go and play in another church because the church of God is one body. So it's not about this is my church, that is my church. We are all still calling the same God. So if the believer finds that it's easier, that the fact that he's able to play in another church makes him or her feel wanted, if that's the best way that he can handle that situation, then so be it. But in, if you God lays it into your heart to take permission from the pastor, for instance, if you've built such a close relationship with the pastor and you feel maybe you're letting the pastor down or the pastor might think this is a, this is um, uh, a way of disobedience or being, uh, what am I going to say? Rebellious. Rebellious. Yes. So if that's the situation, then tell your pastor. But if you're not so close to the pastor, you're not so close to the book, you're just a member that goes to the church and you feel that you are able to play in other churches, then that, that's okay as well. So I don't, I wouldn't say there's a one direct answer to each, mm -hmm. each person's situation. You find the right wisdom and holy spirit will direct you on how to approach each of those situations but there's no sin in going to another church to go and play yeah i uh i i got a gift of prophecy i i uh before i knew it was a gift of prophecy i grew up uh hearing from jesus and when i used to drive my taxi years ago jesus used to say tell this person this and i used to do it uh for years and uh, then I went to a Pentecostal church and uh, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then they had this uh, traveling speaker come in and he taught on the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when he taught on prophecy and word of wisdom and word of knowledge, I realized that I was already doing that. And I'd been doing that for years. So I was a Baptist boy who... Uh, had the gifts of the Holy Spirit flowing through his life. So it's a lie that you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to operate in prophecy. If you can hear from Jesus, you can prophesy. I only I become really sharp and really refined and really good at prophecy through practice. And uh, I'd imagine uh, that's what you were doing in the prison. You were, even though you are languishing in prison, you are practicing and sharpening your gift. Is that are true that uh, not only blessing people, your motivation was uh, staying alive spiritually by exercising your gift, but always being in touch with Jesus. I, I, I know personally that I, I do prophecies for people on my website and uh, I don't get, I used to get uh, three prophecy requests a day and now I get two or three a week, but I always get really excited when I get a prophecy request because I love to hear Jesus speak uh, to people. Um, so uh, do you agree that uh, you got sharper and better with your gift uh, by uh, practicing it? And the reason you're practicing it was to stay aligned with God. Yes, definitely. I do agree that the more I practice, the better I got. Because you remember, I started as a little child. And how you, I did a lot of practice by obviously always telling my brothers, the meaning of their dreams before the same dream got me into trouble. Obviously, I left the house, but I, I still, wherever I was, naturally it comes out. People tell you of your dream, or you ask them, What was your dream? Because I still want to continue to practice the gift so that I can develop more in the gift, just like you're supporting Toluna to continue to practice it. And even though I had the fear as well that, okay, what about I'm interpreting? the dream wrongly but the the more you do it 
the better you are able to hear from the Holy Spirit. And when you interpret a dream and you see that what you've interpreted later came to pass, it gives you more confidence that you are actually interpreting the dream right and you're doing what God is actually laid into your heart, the gifts that he has given you. And apart from that, I see the smile you put on people's faces when you were in the prison. It's, it's like it gave me a reason to continue to survive in the prison. It helps. It was like a coping mechanism for me throughout my time in the prison that even though I'm in prison, I'm still adding value to people's life. I'm still fulfilling the dream and the calling of God on my life. So, and this is an encouragement to people how they're listening. You don't need to get to the palace before you practice your dream. You can start practicing your dream in the prison. Like Matthew has felt he's been in the prison all his life, but he has always used that opportunity. Even in his pain, he's still reaching out to people. He's still sharing love, encouraging. So as Christians that you're listening to me today, whatever gift that God has given you, you don't need to wait. If God has called you to be a giver, you don't need to be earning times three or times four what you are earning now before you start giving. Start practicing little gift there and there. And before you know it, the more you give, the more it grows in, in you. So, and the more you use the gift, the more the presence of God grows in you, the more God, God gives you more because to whom much is given, much is expected. And it's just like the parable of the talent. You use one, you, the, the one that's gone, one kept it and the one that had five was using it. And what did God do? Multiplied it. So the more you use your gift, the more it's been multiplied in you as well. And that was what I experienced. And I think that helped me when I left the prison. And even it was interpretation of dream that got me out of out of prison. So those times that I was doing, those that were still interpreting in the, in the prison, obviously I was perfecting my dream. Maybe God was preparing me for that dream that came from Pharaoh. Maybe because the dream was so complex that you need to have a level of maturity to be able to interpret it right. And that got me to be the king. And that wasn't the end. I, I was still interpreting even on the throne. So it just helps to let us know that a gift that is given to you, if it's not used, you can never develop or grow in it. Yeah, uh, you, uh, you did really well today. Uh, so if there was... If there's a person uh, who uh, who doesn't know uh, their gifts, uh, there's uh, 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 websites that you can do a spiritual gifts test. And if it comes up uh, with uh, prophecy or preaching or teaching or giving, uh, you, you need to uh, do an investigation into how you can practice that. Uh, I encourage uh, people uh, watching this video, uh, if this uh, video uh, brings up any questions for you, you want to know uh, details or you want to know how to access the heavenlies yourself uh, and interview saints yourself, if this uh, video brings up any questions, you can uh, go to the description tag under this video and get my Facebook address and uh, friend request me on Facebook and ask me questions. Um, so uh, if uh, if we're talking uh, to uh, people who uh, feel alike, and this is the final question, uh, if uh, people uh, we're talking to uh, feel like they're in bondage, have never been discovered, uh, they they sort of stuck in a job. Uh, they they uh, got giftings, but they haven't had an opportunity to operate in those giftings, and they haven't been discovered. And they've got prophecies over their life that says they're going to be doing great things, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. They don't know when it's going to happen. And just like uh, you were in prison, and it went on for years, and you had no idea when it was going to uh, you're going to be released or how you're going to be released. What advice would you have to for someone who who's feels that uh, they too are in the prison house? What sort of uh, words can you offer them? The words I'm going to offer people that feel like they're in the prison is what I actually did in the prison. I kept on using my gift, even though the prison wasn't a comfortable place to be, and. Even though I was thinking, God, you gave me so much dream. You told me I was going to rule and I was in the prison. So, but the only thing that kept me going was I kept, I kept on 
utilizing the dream that God, sorry, the gift that God has given me. So the same way I'm going to advise anyone that feels that they are in prison, that whatever gift or talent that God has given to them, they should continue to use it. Their time is going to come and keep believing in God. But for those that do not know what their gift is, that is where services like Matthew's, website they can go to Matthew's website to go and look at buy the services for gifting and Matthew will gladly be able to tell them what their gift is but for a lot of people we already know our gift is something give how you know your gift are things that come natural to you that you don't even need to pray that you just you just do it it's, it it doesn't cost you anything to do that is a gift that God has given you like for Matthew Matthew has got gift of encouragement it likes encouraging people a life lifting people up it's got gift of giving giving to him comes so easy it's given told you so much time in trying to co coach Tolu and there's so many other people that he had and given to other people's ministry so those are the kind of gifts that when God has given you that you are able to identify things like that you continue to use yours might even be gift of entertaining people so gift doesn't really need to be like prophetic evangelism but whatever God has given you as you are in the prison continue to be faithful in utilizing those dreams and your time is definitely going to come Okay, I tell you, uh, have, uh, we're going to close off uh, in a minute. Have you got any uh, final words coming from you uh, for people or you just want to say goodbye? So have you got closing words to close off the video? Yeah. Uh, but before yeah. you say that, uh, the the uh, thing that Tolu was talking about to exercise your gift, everyone uh, uh, leaves heaven with, with a scroll, uh, God has uh, showed them what they're going to do with their life. And uh, I've got a service called a Prophetic Destiny Blueprint on my website where I outline nine or ten things that God wants you to do with your life spiritually. And uh, you can order that service uh, from me, and it's very helpful. So that's what she was referring to. So have you got closing, uh, like so something uh, to say in closing? Yet yeah, um, I've got uh, something to say. Thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Matthew, for allowing this session to happen. I think for me, I've really, really been blessed from because Joseph's story was something I used a lot in my life, and I used to use it to encourage my husband as well when he was facing different challenges of life. So for people that are facing similar things that Joseph has faced, I think this should be a blessing to you. Listen to it. Take um uh take instructions, take guidance from me, whatever Joseph has advised you to be doing, continue doing it. And even though if you feel discouraged, if you feel that you've been waiting upon God, the time has not come, con still continue to trust in God. Joseph at had to wait for 17 years, I guess, before his dream finally come to pass. So the law will continue to strengthen you. And I, I wish you the best and peace and love from me. Okay, so if uh if you uh, like this video uh, and uh, you subscribe to YouTube uh, and uh, you can uh, make comments, uh, press like on the video and uh, that'll save it into a like file on uh, on your thing so you can go back to it. Uh, if uh, you, you feel that you've got friends on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram that uh, would really uh, be blessed by this, uh, feel free to share that and press the share button on YouTube and share it uh, to that network and say something above the video about what you got from it. Uh, if uh, you're subscribed to YouTube and you can comment, uh, I'd really uh, be encouraged with a comment. Uh, uh, and uh, if you like this video, we're going to be doing quite a number of supernatural videos so you can subscribe to the channel and uh, watch uh, your notifications and when one comes up that you want to watch you can watch that uh, i have got a join button on uh, my youtube and you can join for a little amount per month and support me but i'd really encourage you to uh, join for the 30 dollars a month and uh, so uh, into this ministry and uh, i know something about sewing is uh, if you sew 
uh, into a message. Uh, you get more from the message and uh, God's spirit allows you to understand more. And so I'd encourage you to do that. God bless you and keep you. Uh, uh, follow my channel and uh, watch the videos. Uh, it's my prayer that uh, this uh, video deeply ministered to you. And I pray that uh, you uh, want to watch this a second time and glean more for it. Thank you so much for your time, Tulu. And uh, I look forward to uh, doing another video with you. God bless.